All right, our next speaker uh, is uh, Caitlin Nosepchuk. Well, we're really uh, uh, glad to have her here as a guest. Uh, Caitlin is an associate of the HMFH Architects. She was the project architect for the New Fields Elementary School, which is, as I had said earlier, the first net positive energy public school here in New England. Uh, in New England. Ms. Osipchuk recently served as the Young Architect Regional Director, YARD, for the American Institute of Architects. And uh, here she mentored young architects. She holds a master's degree in architecture from Roger Williams University. So please welcome Mr. Sipchuk. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am Caitlin Osepcha. Uh, I work for the architectural firm HMFH, located in Cambridge. You may have heard of us. We've done a few schools uh, around Westboro. And I was extremely proud to be the project architect for the new Annie E. Fales Elementary School on Eli Whitney. So today I'll uh, give you sort of a 35,000 feet dive into the process that HMFH took to design a net zero energy school um, and how we are slated to be uh, the first net positive energy school in Massachusetts. So how do you achieve a net zero energy school? A big factor in planning and the whole process is gaining support from the district, the town, um, teachers, <laughs> faculty, and the neighborhood. You have to set goals as stated before, it takes rigorous planning to be net zero energy and to plan to have um, sustainable outcomes, whether it's in your home, in an office building, or in a school. Establish priorities, research new technologies. Technology is ever changing. What uh, was used previously may not be what's used in the future. Everything is progressing and advancing um, and becoming more efficient. And a large part of sustainability um, is fostering stewardship. So creating um, an environment where children, um, young people can learn about their environment, grow to respect it, and be excited to continue its growth and work with their environment as they live. So gaining support. It was easy in Westboro because of your extremely aggressive sustainability goals for the future, um, and we were happy to be a part of it to help you look towards your greener future. Um, but one of the big, big reasons, uh, and is an easy way to gain support, is to actually uh, analyze the potential cost savings for the town. So we did a simple payback analysis early on in the process. Um, to look at the potential payback goals, paybacks for uh, the new Annie E. Fales Elementary School and whether this was something that the town could take on. So with a traditional payback calculation in about 6.2 years, the energy produced by the new Annie E. Fales Elementary School will pay back the cost associated with uh, designing and constructing a net zero energy school. Set our energy goals so uh, we started out by targeting an energy use intensity, an EUI. Um, and one way to do that is to look at all of the energy that the facility is going to use to run um, on an annual basis and look at different ways that you can cut back on energy use without disrupting the function of the school on a day-to-day -day basis. Energy production produces as much energy as possible. Um, there are a few ways that you can actually define net zero energy. So for the sake of Annie, um, we defined it as producing on-site renewable energy equal to the energy used to operate the building annually. We had to look at all of the different components of energy use, uh, ventilation, heating, cooling, and any pumps in the system to push water through, 
Um, that all includes the HVAC system, which actually ended up being about 52% of the energy use for the new fail school. Um, energy used to heat water, to turn on lights, um, a plug load, so plugging in microphones, charging your phone, um, projectors that are used, and then any exterior elements, um, exterior lights, security cameras, electrical vehicle charging stations, all draw power and all add to the energy use intensity, which we targeted at uh, 27.5. So we looked at a few different strategies on how to reduce energy just in the design of the, the school. The orientation and massing, we chose to orient the building north-south so that all classrooms on the second level had optimum orientation for daylighting. East-west light um, is very glary, it's very strong early in the morning, late at night. Um, north-south is the most even. We chose to bury the lower levels in the hillside. We were lucky enough to have a hilly, hilly site. Um, and this allowed us to use the thermal mass of uh, the site and of the earth to help further insulate the building um, to keep us from losing any heating and cooling produced inside. Energy reduction with the building envelope, we chose to build up the exterior envelope, the facade, and the roof um, with extra installation, again, to keep any extra heat gain in the summer from heating or overheating the spaces inside, and also keeping the interior spaces warm in the winter, so less heat loss. Um, a majority of heat loss is through windows, so we chose to limit the amount of windows on the project. Um, it's currently 25% window, 75% wall. Um, any glazing that is on the project is triple glazed, so it has two air pockets in between three panels of glass. Air is an extremely great insulator. Um, and we balanced the solar heat gain and visible light transference. Lighting. Lights draw a huge amount of energy. Um, we focused on trying to create daylight autonomy, which is percent of operating hours that an area can be lit exclusively with daylight. Now we know that's not always possible throughout the entire day. Cloudy days, you're not gonna get as much daylight to light a classroom um, so that students can actually write. So we do have to use artificial lighting to supplement um, as well as any night activities that occur at the school. So we looked at different ways that we could actually control the artificial light in the school. All of the lights um, in the classrooms, corridors, offices, all have occupancy sensors. So if they don't sense anyone in the room, it turns off. If someone comes in, the lights come on. So there's no human error with forgetting to flip a switch when you leave a room. Um, all of the fixtures within the classrooms are zoned to balance the daylight. So lights that are closer to the window walls uh, will turn off when there's enough sunlight coming in the windows and uh, lights at the back of the classroom, sort of in the blue zone for the diagram on the right, will turn on to supplement, giving even light distributions throughout the whole room while also using the daylight that's coming in through the windows. All of the lights can be controlled by uh, the master control system, which is called the building management system, BMS, um, and can be programmed, again, to take out human error. So everything is on a schedule and we know when it can turn on and turn off. Um, and the building can work for us and help us be more sustainable. All of the light fixtures that were chosen have low power densities, so they don't need as much energy to run throughout the day. As noted before, 52% of our energy use intensity was for heating and cooling, HVAC, in the building. So we looked at a few different ways to reduce the overall energy needed to heat and cool and properly ventilate the space. We chose to use a geothermal well system 
which actually uses the latent energy and heat within the core of the earth, within our site, um, to heat and cool the building. There are still HVAC equipment inside the building. Um, there is a chiller that has heat exchange panels that actually takes the energy that is pulled up through the geothermal wells, transfers it to the interior portion of the HVAC, HVAC system, and runs it through. So we are still using some energy to get the temperatures either up or down to optimal heating or cooling levels, but we're not using as much. We're not starting at zero. We're starting at around 55 degrees. All right, all you mathletes out there. So once we took that broad dive into um, looking at different ways that we could design the building to be more energy efficient just in aesthetic, um, we got down to the nitty gritty <laughs> and looked at uh, energy production and, and did a lot of math. So our energy use intensity, the amount of energy per square foot to operate the building over a course of a year, the less energy you need to function, the less energy you need to produce. Um, a typical benchmark is about 75. For fails, we targeted 27 and a half. So we were very aggressive in that. Um, we looked at the annual energy used Previously, in the future, other case studies, um, other schools in Massachusetts to come up with how much energy would be needed each year. And that ended up being 2,178,000 kBTUs. But of course, solar panels <laughs> don't equate to kBTUs. So we had to do some more math um, and convert our kBTU into kilowatt hours. Um, once we did that, we found out 638,154 kilowatt hours was the energy, electrical energy needed to run the building. So how many panels do you need for that? Um, there is uh, some factors that uh, will make you know, our, our hard mathematical numbers uh, not come out quite right. Um, solar exposure is a big portion of that. You can have as many solar panels as you want, but if they're not facing the sun, they're not gonna produce for you. Um, weather data. Some days are cloudy, some days are sunny, so all of these uh, need to factor in when we're trying to figure out exactly how big the PV panel array needs to be. And obviously the type of system stated before, technology is ever changing. Um, systems are becoming more and more efficient um, and systems work better for different applications. So we figured about four panels would produce one kilowatt, which yields about 1,100 kilowatt hours per year. More math, more math. We determined that a 580 kilowatt system was needed to run the new school. We then had to equate that into square footage. How many uh, PV panels could we fit on the roof? It, uh, it factored out to about 31,909 square feet, not about. Um, with a 70,000 square foot building, that seems pretty doable. Um, we're on two levels, so that cuts us in half. Now we're down to 35,000 square feet. So that ultimately means the entire roof needs to be covered in PV panels. Which seems okay, right? We still have a little space left over. But now we get back to our daylight autonomy goal and wanting to use as much natural daylight as possible to light all of the spaces. So we had two conflicting ideas. Optimal daylight skylights all on the roof to get to every internal space to light it. Optimal solar panels cover the entire roof to produce as much uh, energy as needed. So we looked at a few different combined strategies and what was going to be the most effective both for daylight autonomy and photovoltaic production. Which led us to the sawtooth roof that you now see on the new Anna E. Fail School. Um, 
by lifting the area that was going to have the solar panels on it, we increased the roof area by 18%, which gave us more space for um, solar panels and more space for skylights. So we were still able to bring in a lot of natural light to light all of the interior spaces um, and actually give an expression to the building mass itself about sustainability and the sustainability practices at the new Annie E. Fails and in Westboro. So once we knew we needed to do a sawtooth roof, um, we started to look at different roof massings um, that would work with both the interior spaces in the classrooms on the second level, as well as provide optimal solar orientation for those PV panels so that we could get the most bang for our buck. During design development, one of the phases of design, um, we calculated that we needed about 1,600 panels um, on the roof to run the school annually, factoring in all of the system lots, monthly production, energy draw at the evening. And then through some more fine tuning, looking at different energy draws within the school, we ultimately came up with a panel design that was 1,354 panels. If you really want to, you can go out there and count them today. <laughs> um, which ended up with a 508 kilowatt system, producing 648,291 kilowatt hours per year. So how did we do? At the start of construction, we again ran all of those numbers. Um, did an energy analysis. So we started out with a targeted EUI of 27 and a half. We ended up at 24.9. So we did much better than originally anticipated. Our annual energy use was again targeted and slated at 638,000 kilowatt hours. Through great design from our engineers and coordination with all of the faculty, maintenance and staff at Annie E. Fails we ended up with 585,000 kilowatt hours. So we are using much less energy than originally expected. The annual energy production was originally 638,000, again, to be net zero energy. And with the PV panels and the increased technology, we ended up with 648,000 kilowatt hours. So we are actually producing more than we are using about 10% give or take. The size of the system, because we had um, new technologies and more efficient PV panels, could be smaller, 508 kilowatts. Each watt per panel was originally 320, 375. So again, more efficient. And I'm sure even today, if we wanted to replace the PV panels on the roof, we would find better producing panels. Um, and because of that, we were able to decrease the number of panels and the PV array size that we needed on the roof, which gave more space for more natural light and skylights. So those were our energy goals, very intensive. But now there were design goals that the district wanted um, that we needed to focus on. And we decided to look at all of the sustainable attributes for these design goals. A connection to nature, a design for young children, and how to maintain an intimate neighborhood school. So, an intimate neighborhood school of 70,000 square feet. <laughs> I spoke before on how we decided to sort of bury the school into the hillside for its thermal mass that also allowed us to decrease the scale of the school so it didn't seem so opposing in the neighborhood. And also felt like a better size for kindergarten through third grade students who are short. <laughs> we chose to continue to articulate um, the PV panels and the sawtooth roof system in the classrooms and all occupied spaces on the second floor. Um, to bring more daylight in, create light, open, airy spaces that the students would be excited to come to every day to learn. Um, it also created great views out to the environment 
fostering that connection to nature, getting everyone excited about the environment that they're in. They could be reading about something that happened 150 years ago, and then they can look outside and see exactly what's going on in nature around them. The library, the media center on the second floor is sort of at the center of the space, the heart of the school, all learning, passing on of knowledge. Um, so when you enter the second level of the school, you can see straight through the building and connect with the roof canopy above, giving you a new vantage point, a new experience, and a new way to connect with nature. How do you design for kindergarten through third grade students and teach them about their environment in ways that they wouldn't necessarily see on a daily basis? We incorporated Annie, the mascot for Annie Fails, which is a hedgehog. Um, so in the project areas and breakout spaces throughout the second floor, uh, the students can see Annie going on various different adventures through different ecosystems and environments throughout New England. There's a forest, a pond, a wetland, and a meadow. <laughs> this is one of the murals in place in the project area, um, and Amber Bach, the superintendent, said it extremely eloquently. Our new school educates students about the natural environment and sustainable practices and we hope it inspires a lifelong care for the world they live in, fostering that connection and promoting stewardship. <clears throat> Another way that we chose to educate the students on sustainable practices and actually how the environment that they inhabit Monday through Friday is helping to work with the environment that they get to see out their windows um, to keep them comfortable and give them a beautiful space to learn. There is a touch screen monitor on the second floor that actually displays all of the energy use, energy produced, um, and all of the sustainable attributes of the school that the students are in. So they can learn about the geothermal well system that is out in uh, the fields that they're going out to play in during recess. They can learn about the photovoltaic panels that are on the roof that they can experience with the big sloping angled ceilings while they're in class. Um, learn about thermal mass and temperature control and get a better feeling for how everything that they do affects nature and help them to want to make positive choices and positive changes um, to continue to foster growth and a better environment for the future. So that's the new Annie E. Fails. It is currently still under construction. The site is being worked on now. Um, but I hope you all take a little trip over to 50 Eli Whitney and take a look at the new school um, and see it in action. Mm -hmm.